Welcome back to Cross-Cultural Communication and Management. This is Topic 1 of the Lecture on the Taxonomy of Diversity, or Cultural Values. There are five topics in this lecture. In this lecture, we will cover the five most cited fundamental concerns that all human societies need to have in order to form a human's culture. They are group attachment, hierarchy acceptance, gender association, uncertainty avoidance, and time orientation. The degrees of importance that each society and individual places on these concerns create so many different values, leading to the immense diversity that we see in the cultures around us. Let's start with a recap of what we have learned so far. We know now that for animals, genes are their life guidance, telling them what to eat, when to hunt, and how to survive. For humans, culture is our life guidance. A culture tells us what to eat, when to say yes, when to say no, and how to get things done. That's why cultural competence means the ability to adapt to and create a culture. The reason for this transition is that culture is faster, richer, and more dynamic than genes. Culture interacts with four drivers, leading to an incredible diversity around us. Culture changes, according to different geographical environments. Culture changes with the support of genes, to pass on the most useful values for our survival. Culture changes, because the brain has some flexibility, to let us change our own values, and also the cultures around us. And finally, culture changes, if we collectively change our behaviors. This interaction occurs at all levels from the universal level where we are all the same, to the collective level with many cultures, and the individual level, where each of us is unique, and also where we mostly communicate and do business with. Because of this dynamics, in order to understand a culture, we need to look at the specific context and go beyond cultural stereotypes. For example, applying individual incidents to judge the whole culture, or using oversimplified belief of a culture to judge a unique individual. We can compare culture with a tree. The trunk represents fundamental concerns, such as religion, language, or hierarchy. They are building blocks of culture that all societies need. The branches represent values. We identify a value by asking, how important is this concern? High, low, or moderate? The canopy represents outward expressions with specific objects, symbols, and behaviors. Part of the outward expression is nonverbal communication. We use time, space, and body language to communicate, to judge, and create our identities. We may rely on these nonverbal cues at high or low level. So, in this tree of culture, let's start with one example. At the trunk of the tree, respect is a fundamental concern that all human cultures need to have. At the branches, each society, Individual or specific context may place the importance of respect on a low, moderate, or high level. Then at the canopy, outward expressions mean we can have many specific ways to show respect, such as bowing or not arguing with those we respect. So that's for respect. If I ask you to list other fundamental concerns that are necessary to make a culture, you probably will list things such as loyalty, hierarchy, conformity, risk taking, bravery, and so many more. However, this can be a never-ending list. Surely there must be a framework to categorize this list and make it short enough to comprehend. Many theorists have tried to do exactly that. And here are the most five common fundamental concerns in the literature of the field. They are group attachment, hierarchy acceptance, gender association, uncertainty avoidance, and time orientation. So let's start with our first fundamental concern, a cultural element called group attachment. Group attachment is defined as the extent to which one gives her or his in-group priority over oneself. At the universal level, every human being has evolved to love and attach to her or his in-group at the baseline level. Our ancestors spent many thousands of years on the savanna 
where they live in small groups that support each other. The importance of in-groups is so fundamental, that the brain has evolved to decide who is in-group and out-group extremely quickly. Here is a slide that we have repeated a few times, because it is so important. The brain when seeing in-group people, activates quite differently from seeing out-group. This discrimination process is automatic, built-in for survival. In our modern era, in-group does not always mean trust, and out-group people may be friends. We don't live on the savanna anymore, but the brain still works in the same, old, savanna way. To this day, our brain still automatically categorizes people into in-group, or out-group, based on signals such as, skin color, gender, language, or even clothes. It takes only one-tenth of a second, for the brain to make trust decision. And so the bottom line is, every one of us has a bias, of attaching more, to our own in-groups. At the collective level, we see a divergence. If the triangle represents group, and the red dot represents an individual, then above the baseline level, some cultures promote strong and some cultures promote weak group attachment. There are other terms for these. Strong group attachment is called collectivism and weak group attachment is called individualism. However, from the evolutionary point of view, individualism can be a bit misleading. Nobody can live individually and still survive. We need a collective and learn a culture from that collective. Everyone and every society has to be collectivistic. It is just more or less. We are the same in kind, but different in level. That's why for this course, I have formulated a new terminology, weak and strong group attachment. I would like to show you this picture. Let's have a little guess. In which culture is group-oriented behavior more likely to happen? In Mexico or Canada? In rural or urban area? Among religious or non-religious? Among poor or rich? Among farmers or bankers? And finally, among women or men? By answering these questions, we probably are using stereotypes based on our own experience. Which is fine in a way. But it also shows that, we have so many cultures in a country, and opposing values can coexist. This reminds us of the static paradigm, which gives each country a number, and now we can see, that such a number, may overlook the complex diversity at the collective level. At the individual level, I would like to ask, if you have weak, moderate, or strong group attachment. You may pick an answer, but in fact, you should probably question me back. Which group are you talking about? This is because we have so many group cultures at the collective level, and our loyalty to them varies. In the Middle East, for example, many people are more loyal to their tribal groups, or their religion, than to their country. Also, group attachment can change as the context changes. Finally, I hope you remember this slide, from one of our last lectures. In this experiment, one group read a text with plural pronouns, the other with singular pronouns. As a result, they prefer different leadership styles. It's incredible, that a short text can so significantly change our mind, and our decision. It indicates that, the brain is capable of hosting opposing values. As some studies have suggested, we can even cultivate a multicultural mind, that allows us to switch values spontaneously, depending on specific contexts. People who are internationally successful, are more likely those, who can develop this flexible mindset. I really can't strongly emphasize enough, that each individual, is unique, and dynamic. And this, is the level that we mostly communicate, and do business with. We now move to the canopy of the tree, which is where this fundamental concern, and different values express themselves. First, it has a lot to do with harmony, and keeping face. You show strong, or weak group attachment, by the extent to which you express disagreement, debate, and criticize others, with, or without making them lose face. You also show strong, or weak group attachment, when you choose to give compliment to a person individually, or to the whole group. Similarly, the value of weak, or strong expresses in the way you solve conflict. Do you want to clearly point out, who is right, and who is wrong? Or do you want to make peace, and get everyone moving forward in harmony? 
Next, group attachment is about interdependence and trust. For example, strong or weak attachment could be how much you want to invest in a good working relationship. Will talking from time to time be enough, or does it have to be months, if not years of building trust and showing support? It could also mean how willing you are to sacrifice for your in-groups. Would you stay over time, working much harder, to cover for your team, or would you prioritize your personal well-being? Similarly, this value expresses itself in what it takes for you to trust someone. Do you trust this counterpart because that person is competent or because you know that person very well? I gave you this outward expression of strong group attachment behavior in one of the previous slides. Here are a few more. I took this picture in Malawi, where even a baby learns strong group attachment by working to help family. Then in the US and Europe, it is quite common to see children with their lemonade stands earning their own pocket money, learning how to be independent and not relying on other. However, don't let outward expressions fool you because the same behavior can mean different values. Here is Alex. She was diagnosed with cancer at the age of four. She started a lemonade stand to raise money for her doctors and to help other children with cancers. Her strong group attachment value ended up with more than $200 million in donation, funding thousands of research projects worldwide. Here is another example of strong group attachment. In 2009, amidst a corruption scandal, former President Romu Yun of South Korea committed suicide. In some cultures, killing yourself does not mean you are running away from problems. It actually means redeeming your fault with the highest price you can afford, your own life. This way, your reputation with the in-group can be recovered. And of course, you can always find people in the same culture who hold somewhat opposite value and behavior. In 2014, the captain of a South Korean ferry abandoned his sinking ship with more than 300 casualties. And then he was later found, well, drawing his money on the riverbank. Which you would probably agree with me, that is not so much of a strong group attachment. Finally, we may wonder, why there is a diversity in weak and strong group attachment? Why some cultures tend to promote the benefit of the group more strongly than others? One theorist, Hofstede, addressed this question by using environment. According to his argument, hot climate contributes to collectivism, because tropical food is abundant, so the main enemy is other competing groups. Cold climate contributes individualism, because people learn to fend for themselves, without being too dependent on more powerful others. However, we can incorporate insight from evolutionary biology and seek for a more complete answer. Let's go back to this slide, from one of our previous lectures. Many thousands of years ago, our ancestors migrated to the equatorial regions of the world, where tropical climates usually means there was a high load of pathogens, bacteria and viruses that could cause dangerous diseases. In this kind of environment, following group rules, such as how to prepare food, and being sensitive to social cues to avoid danger, can lead to survival benefit. Because culture is our survival strategy, instead of relying on genetic evolution to win over pathogen, humans evolved a group-oriented culture to deal with this environmental challenge. Those who could fit well into this culture would survive and have more children. Then, we also have genes playing a crucial role. A number of studies suggest that the shorter version of the serotonin transporter gene is associated with higher level of social sensitivity, both positive and negative events. There is an interesting hypothesis that this genetic variation supports the evolution of group culture because it makes people more sensitive to the social surrounding. People with this gene had some evolutionary advantages, and so the gene became dominant in the population. In turn, its dominance then reinforced the cultural values of group orientation. So surprisingly, compared to Hofstede's argument, this theory has almost an opposite way to explain cultural difference. Some societies promote strong group attachment, not because they already have a rich nature resource, and what's left, is dealing with other competing groups. Instead, strong group attachment evolved, because their living environment is hostile and dangerous. On the left, you see a map of how this gene, 
associated with social sensitivity, is distributed around the world. And on the right, is the distribution of the group value. High level of this gene, is associated with high level of collectivism or strong group attachment. To this day, up to 80% of the East Asian population carry this gene, while his number is half, among European population. Again, I have to repeat an important note and strongly emphasize that, it is incorrect to say that this gene leads to group culture or vice versa. The interaction is much more complicated than that. These values have changed significantly, under many historical events, such as colonization, wars, economic development, crisis and globalization. Most important of all, these weak and strong values, have been changing dynamically, due to our conscious collective behaviors, towards what is good for oneself individually, and what is good for the whole group. To conclude, group attachment, is the extent to which, a person prioritizes her, or his in-group, above her or himself. At the universal level, this in-group bias is critical for our survival, because the group is our source of support. At the collective, and individual level, different degrees of weak, and strong group attachment vary across different cultures, individuals and particular contexts. Please note that other terms for these, are individualism and collectivism. However, individualism can be a bit misleading. All human beings have to be collectivistic to survive, it is just the level is strong or weak. For outward expressions, we show strong or weak group attachment, by the extent to which we prioritize harmony, keeping face, building trust, and having interdependence among each other. The origin of weak and strong group attachment arises from how humans use culture as a survival strategy to deal with environmental challenge. These values of weak and strong, have been changing dynamically, with both external events, such as globalization, and also internally, with our conscious behaviors.